Yeah. Thank you very much. And 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 Katya and 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 Knut, I mean, thank you so much for running this important tradition. I, I'm afraid that you will never get rid of this tradition that, that people want to hear this, that this continues uh, like years and years. Anyway, uh, I'm speaking today about uh, discrete inverse problems, so inverse problems for graphs, and these results have been done in collaboration with with Emilia Blosten uh, from Lut University, Hiroshi Isosaki from from Tsukuba and Ching Peng Lu uh, from, from University of Helsinki. Okay, so I first uh, recall some uh, uh, inverse problems for partial differential equations in Euclidean space and on a manifold to motivate uh, the formulation of the discrete problem. And then we go to discrete metric space and, and graph Laplacian. And then we are basically like starting from this kind of familiar seismic imaging picture where you have uh, sources either on the boundary or you can think that they are slightly inside the medium and then you record uh, also in the same region uh, the, the waves. So let me recall that uh, the classical inverse problem for wave equation is that you consider a, a body typically in three dimensions in Euclidean space and you want to find the wave speed um, uh, that, that corresponds to a Riemannian metric. Indeed, the travel times of waves can be considered as, as, as non-Euclidean metric. And uh, in, in acoustic medium, for instance, it can be written in terms of a Riemannian, uh, Riemannian metric. So reconstructing of the medium, for instance, this picture here, um, um, the intermediate step would be to reconstruct the wave speed or the Riemannian, Riemannian metric in the medium. And actually, I want to emphasize this curious fact that these familiar pictures, for instance, when you have ultrasound of babies, this picture here is not in the in the in the Euclidean physical coordinates, but but when you do this kind of imaging, the uh, the medium works as a lens, so the rays along which the waves travel they bend, uh, and and this picture is done by assuming that the rays would be straight lines. So this picture here. That, uh, is, is actually image in the Riemannian normal coordinates. So image problems are very, very geometric. And uh, one way to formulate image problem for wave equation is to consider uh, um, uh, problems either in, in a domain of Rn or a compact manifold. We have wave equation where we have Laplacian associated to a Riemannian metric. We have uh, some boundary source. Here it is the Neumann boundary value, but, but you could consider that this is a physical source. Uh, the wave at times t is equal to zero is zero, and then you send the wave by using this source. And here this uh, Laplacian associated to metric G, it is formal given here. Um, and we will consider a little bit similar type of formulas for discrete Laplacians. And we denote the solution of this wave equation here with the unknown metric G, but uh, source F that we can control by UF. And we define the Neumann to Diddle map that maps the, the Neumann value to the Diddle value of the solution. Or you can think that this is a source to solution map that maps a source to values of solution in some, some um, um, measured on the boundary. And the boundary data would be the collection of the of knowing the boundary and then this uh, Neumann to drill operator. And we asked, does this determine the manifold and the metric unit? I uh, here I emphasize that in this wave equation, we have this uh, uh, second order time derivative, but we can formulate very, very similar problem by changing this derivative. I change it now. So just the first order time derivative. Initial conditions somehow change slightly, but otherwise the formulation is of the problem is the same. And this indicates that we can use very similar methods to study uh, inverse problems for wave equation or for heat equation. And both of these inverse problems are for, both for wave equation and for heat equation, they are actually equivalent to inverse boundary spectral problem. There you consider the eigenvalue problem for Laplacian. So we have eigenvalues lambda j of the Laplace operator, orthonormal eigenfunctions, uh, 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 phi j. And at the data that we, and this, okay, here they are defined with normal boundary condition. 
And we assume that we are in the in, in inverse uh, boundary spectral problem. You assume that you are given the boundary, the eigenvalues, and boundary values of, of the normalized eigenfunctions. And it is shown that this data determines a compact Riemann manifold with boundary up to an isometry. This goes back to actually in the Euclidean space to Nachman, Silverstels, and, and Ulmer result. Uh, for wave equation techniques were developed by Belisev and Kurilev using Belisev's boundary control method. And these methods have been recently implemented numerically by uh, Dehoop, Kepley, and Oxenen. And we also mentioned that with Burago, Ivanov, and Lu, this Jingpeng Lu here, the same uh, person who is collaborating this project that I report. Uh, we also have stability results for this inverse boundary spectral problem. And now we are going to uh, replace this problem by analogous discrete problem. So what is the motivation to study discrete problems? If we discretize this equation, we use either finite difference or finite element methods, then we are, are led to uh, actually uh, equations that are very close to Laplacians on finite graphs. For instance, if we would consider uh, steady state problems like conductivity equation, then uh, the finite difference or finite element approximations, they lead to a matrix equation that be, can be considered as a, as a register network or a Laplacian uh, on, on graph. Also in manifold learning, the, the discrete Laplace operators appear. For instance, in, in understanding uh, like complicated data sets like in manifold learning, when you want to from, uh, find a manifold from, from discrete data sets, you, you correspond to uh, discrete Laplacian. There's an eigenmap map algorithm developed by Coifan and, and, and Lafon. And uh, there one computes actually uh, for this type of discrete data. First, a graph that corresponds to k nearest neighbors, defines their Laplace operator, and, and, and computes the eigenfunctions of this uh, discrete Laplacian, and then maps map all points to values of the eigenfunctions. And this creates uh, embedding of, of, of data set to uh, m dimensional space if you use m first uh, eigenfunctions. And, and this can be used to dimensional reduction that you embed your data in a reasonable way to, to lower dimensional uh, Euclidean spaces. Also, these discrete problems are encountered in, in the theory of social networks, in search algorithms, in machine learning, and in Bayesian statistics. But let me go to uh, now regression of the uh, internet. We go to graph Laplacians. And for that end, I will make some definitions. So we have here now this uh, discrete uh, graph. So we have a set X that is finite. And, and when we speak about, about graph, then we speak about edges. An edge here is actually the pair of two points in, in this capital X, points X and Y, that are connected. So this E lists all pairs of points that are connected. And I assume here that the graph is symmetric, which means that it is undirected. For inverse problems, we need a set where we do observations. So uh, we consider some set B. In these kind of pictures that I show, the, the white nodes are actually set B. And as I, I want to um, imitate inverse boundary value problems in, in for PDEs, actually I use this use, use this type of graph where the observation nodes are here on the boundary, but, but there is no restriction that they could be actually any, any nodes. So we assume that we know subset B, where observations, we know these, uh, these proofs, the connections are unknowns. We also assume that there are weights. Every edge here, it has a weight that corresponds to a, a kind of metric that is denoted by G, X, Y, and every node here Every x here has a weight uh, mu x. And then we define a discrete Laplacian that is given in this formula. So this, uh, y, we, when we evaluate the Laplacian at point x, then we sum here over all nodes y that are neighboring x. So if we would for the, uh, evaluate the Laplacian here, then we would look these three neighboring uh, 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 nodes and the value of u at these points. And the motivation for this formulation 
comes actually that if you would take uh, like for like elliptic partial difference equation, you use finite difference approximation. For instance, if you have just a Euclidean Laplacian, you use this typical five stencil discretization to discretize it, then you get very similar uh, formulas for finite difference approximation for Laplacians. There are two important subcases, the combinatorical Laplacians, where all weights are one, and transitive Laplacians, where the edges have weight one, and the nodes have weight that is degree x. So the number of connections from x to the base, this values u on x, sorry, the, the functions u on x, they can be actually considered as a finite vector. And Laplace now maps finite vector to finite vector, so actually it is a finite matrix, but it is of, it is of special form. This is the operators that we consider. And let me consider now the formula to inverse spectral problem and corresponding inverse problem for heat equation or graphs. So uh, we have now this uh, discrete Laplacian that is actually a matrix. It has eigenvalues and eigenvectors that I now call just like eigenfunction. I call eigenvectors actually eigenfunction. And we have that we normalize them. B. So this all these white white nodes. Uh, and then we, we know, know in addition to that B, we know eigenvalues and restrictions of eigenfunctions in these white nodes B. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, like I said, this Laplacian is now finite matrix. So uh, it is like if here we have um, size of X or number of elements in X. So we actually, if this is N, then we have N eigenvalues. And we asked that from this data, can we reconstruct these blue nodes and their connections? For instance, we could ask this kind of thing that we would have this kind of graphene like of hexagonal lattice. We remove uh, one connection here and ask that, could we see this from boundary data? Can we see that, that some of the graph has somehow been damaged, that there, some connection has been broken? This is a typical question that we are interested in in, in this problem. So this has very close connection to uh, like heat equation. We can consider, and, and also for random box, we could consider, for instance, finite, uh, sorry, we could consider a discrete uh, time or, or continuous time heat equation. Here we have continuous time heat equation where X uh, is, is, is uh, runs over this finite space X and T here runs over the real axis. For this, we could uh, think that we do observations. We have sources in set B and observe uh, also solutions in B. So we would have a source to solution map that takes in a function f that is the source that is supported in, in b times uh, positive real axis, uh, and we observe the waves in 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 the same set. And we would ask that if we are given set b and this short to solution map, can we determine uh, the, the 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 unknown uh, um, vertices or nodes? Can we determine the connections and can we determine the weights? And actually, the, this problem here also reduces to inverse boundary spectral problem in the same way as uh, Nahman Silverstein or Uman um, like found the disconnection of the, the PDEs and inverse spectral problems on 80s. And so, so this here would now mean that we consider an uh, equation where we have sources of, of heat uh, on these uh, white nodes. The heat is somehow. Um, Diffuse goes through diffusion process in these blue nodes, and we observe things only on these white nodes. Anyway, unfortunately, or, or maybe fortunately, and these problems are not generally not generally uniquely solvable. They are counter examples for general graphs, which means that we will pose in this talk conditions for for graphs on which we can solve this problem. So here is an example of, of, of two finite graphs. Uh, here, all weights are uh, on the edges are one. The nodes have weight four. And if you consider these two uh, uh, graphs that are clearly different, 
if you do measurements in nodes V1 and V2, um, all measurements coincide. So all eigenvalues values coincide and all values of eigenfunctions coincide. Actually, this type of graphs were studied uh, earlier when you study only the spectrum. But it turns out that for these graphs, also the values of eigenfunctions in V2 and V1 uh, take coincide. And this, for instance, means that if we send a random walk, we will later consider random walks. If we send a random walk from V1 uh, or V2, and then observe that when it comes back to V1 or V2, the random walk observations for these two graphs are just the same. So the moral of this example is that, that we have to pose some conditions if you want to obtain uniqueness results for inverse problems. And this is what we do next. For that, then I first some, make some basic definitions. Uh, when we speak about the distances, we want to consider this graph as a metric space. Now we consider the, uh, the metric where all edges have uh, length one. So uh, when I want to ask what's the distance from one node to another, then I consider paths. The path is a sequence of vertices that are all connected together. So we start from X, then we go to some node that is connected to it and continue from node to node. Uh, uh, and until we reach the node that is our, our, our goal node. And the distance is, is defined as the, uh, as the length of the minimal path connecting X to Y. So from, from this point here, to here, for instance, the distance is now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, 8, 9. So these two boundary nodes, they have distance 8. Uh, so the distance, I emphasize that the distance is not related, associated to these weight Gs. Then we have to introduce a little bit more complicated definition that is related to extreme points. And uh, and uh, and let me first explain this before I look at this definition, let me ex explain this uh, it is using the picture. We consider a subset S of the graph and we define then extreme points in this, in this uh, uh, set S in the following way. We say that uh, uh, vertex x0 is a extreme point of this set S with respect to these white nodes, these nodes in, the, in, in set B. If there exists uh, observation node Z such that if I consider this set, so all points in S with distance is less or, uh, or equal to, uh, to point Z than distance from x0. If this set is just x0, then we say that x0 is uh, extreme point. So what, it, what this means? So here is the definition in, in, in words. We say that x0 is an extreme point of S if there exists a point Z in the Z B such that uh, x0 is the unique nearest point in S from Z. So it just means that this condition, this, this red formula here, that this set having this distance condition consists only of, of single point. It should be opposite in equality. Uh, sorry. That, uh, let's see. Oh, so let me have a look. So we, we so so let's see. So so let's consider this number. Like in this picture here, this distance is one, two, three, four, like here. Yeah. So th then we consider all points here with distance from Z is less or equal to four. So, so this point here, for instance, has distance five. So it is not in, in this set. Uh, so X zero is the only point that has distance four or less to Z. I hope that this was correct, but thank you very much for, for, for asking actually. I will check this later, yeah. So what the motivation for this comes uh, from this type of picture, that if we have a square in, in, in plane, and then we take any set, any closed set in, 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 in a square, and then set B is now here the boundary. Uh, this set S here has the highest point. 
And the highest point has the property that if we go straight up to, to Z, then the intersection of this, uh, uh, this uh, ball having this, this radius that is distance from Z to X, so this here, contains only single point because this X0 was the highest point. So in this case, we see that X0, the highest point, is extreme point. Uh, and in the extreme point definition, we use this point Z0 on the boundary. So a set in the plane has highest point and it has the lowest point. So any set, any closed set here that has at least two points, it has to also to separate, uh, like uh, it has uh, one highest point and one lowest point that gives two extreme points. So uh, extreme points imitate this definition of the highest or lower, lowest points. And the sets in the plane have two extreme points. And this we take as a definition. We say that the graph um, uh, uh, satisfies a two-point condition with respect to C, with respect to the observations at B, if the following is, is true. We take any subset S that has at most at least two points, then we require that there is that there are there are two extreme points with respect to, uh, to that, that, that B. So we just take sets that imitate these planar sets. If, if the graph is, is a little bit like this planar set, it, every, every set here uh, that has two points has also two extreme points. And this is valid for, uh, for, for, for all trees. If the observation sets consist of, of leaves that have, have, have only one connection to other points. And also, uh, we, it will turn out that, that many of the perturbations of lattices satisfies this two point condition. I come later to this, uh, this lattice question. So here's our result with, 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 with Blosten, Isosaki, and Lu is that if we have two points, uh, sorry, two graphs like X and X prime corresponding uh, connections and weights that satisfy, we up here know that they satisfy the two points condition. Then uh, if we identify, and we assume now that sets, the measurement sets B and, and B prime can be identified. So they have actually like, like same number of elements. So then if the eigenvalues on this graph coincide and the values of eigenfunctions in set B coincide, then <clears throat> the, the graphs uh, have to be isomorphic, which means that there is a bijection between these graphs so that that, uh, that that respects the, uh, the so that the uh, two nodes on E, so, sorry, the two nodes in graph X is con are connected if and only in, if the corresponding points on the graph X prime are connected. And moreover, the vectors mu and vectors G are the, uh, are the same. So here should be actually two points like G, X, Y, and um, phi X, uh, phi Y. So here was a misprint. So what this basically means, if we assume that the two points condition is split, then uh, knowing the observations at B and the spectral data, eigenvalues and restrictions of eigenfunctions, they determine uniquely a graph that is isometric to the graph that we consider. So we can determine the graph, uh, the, the, the missing vertices, that, like in this picture, the, all these blue vertices and all the connections and weights in this graph uniquely. So before explaining the idea of the proof, let me consider uh, how we test that when, when, graph, when uh, some um, sufficient conditions when a graph satisfies these two points condition. And um, so this actually now imitates this highest point and lowest point uh, that we discussed earlier. We say that the function h is a height function if the following things are valid. First, the function is Lipschitz one function. So we, when we go from one point to a neighboring point, it changes at most by value one. And then we ask that what happens what, like, that when it changes in the maxi maximal way. Uh, here are two sets that I call discrete gradients. So if we are here at point X, I ask that what are all those points Y? That are neighboring to x and where the function h grows in maximal way. So we, 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 uh, when we go from x to y, we 
we change the value of h by maximal value, the value one, that is now the maximal value. So this n plus of x, this shows the nodes where the function grows maximally. So we can think that as a discrete gradient of this height function. And, and also we can ask that where the function decreases minimally, this also like negative um, direction of the gradient. And if these discrete gradients, if they consist of sets that are, uh, are have exactly one element, um, the interior nodes, and at most one element on the observation set B, then uh, we say that the function is a height function. And if the height function, if there exists a height function, then the graph satisfies two points condition. So what is the point here of the, like, like this picture, for instance, the height function is just the intuitive height function that here in the first layer, it has height zero, then it has one, then you have, your height is two, three, and so on. So that basically, also it means that we can always start from any point and go to the unique direction where the height grows maximally. So this is a, a certain kind of foliation condition where we, we know that we can always go to unique direction of the highest growth of the height. And this somehow can be used to show that many standard lattices satisfy this two-point condition. For instance, we can take this hexagonal lattice and remove here any number of, 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 of horizontal edges uh, so that this graph still stays uh, connected. And then this, uh, this uh, graph satisfies the, the two points condition. So both of these here have height function and they satisfy just the two, two points condition. Here are other examples. We could have uh, this kind of like, like three dimensional uh, or even a two dimensional or three dimensional uh, uh, square lattice or a triangular lattice. And this, in this way, we can see that most of these standard lattices satisfies two point condition. There are, are examples actually of lattices that don't satisfy. For instance, uh, there is a Kagome lattice that the name comes from the Japanese designs of, of items. But it, that is one example of, 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 of standard lattices that don't satisfy two points condition, but, but many of the standard lattices satisfy. So let me actually now explain the main ideas of this proof that that if we are given observations at B, and we are given, and let me call this now a boundary set, because in the pictures it, it's always a boundary set. And if we know the eigenvalues and restrictions of eigenfunctions, that we can determine uh, the, the graph uniquely. So this is slightly technical, and it imitates uh, like equation uh, techniques that we used for partial differential equations, especially for wave equation. Let us consider discrete space, discrete time uh, wave equation. So here the discrete uh, space comes from the fact that we as use a discrete set capital X and, and, and discrete Laplacian to graph Laplacian. And then the time derivative, time here is now integer valued and the time derivative is actually just a finite uh, difference in time. So we consider discrete time wave equation. And then we put here initial data, so time derivative of the initial data here is zero. The time derivative of the, um, sorry, the value of the, we write the value of the wave at time t is equal to zero by using eigenfunctions with coefficients aj. So this aj is determined the initial state. <clears throat> and then we consider observations on the boundary. We, cons we say that, um, 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 this set capital S of functions, uh, small s from B to Z, that are like observation time functions. Uh, so we say that that function S, small s belongs to set capital S. If there is some initial state, for instance, that could, there would be an initial state that is supported in this red node. And, and then we define this function S on the boundary node that is such that we are here, if you sit here in the boundary node, uh, Z, and we wait, we can wait time uh, S of Z before we observe anything. So uh, for all times T that are less than S of Z, the wave stays zero. So basically we put here some initial state, then we are on observing things on the boundary, 
and we ask how long time we can wait until the wave arrives to the boundary set. And, and this could be said that these are like observation time functions. And I consider the collection of all those functions. This set is a partially ordered set. Uh, so we can speak about the maximal elements in this partially ordered set. And here actually I, I, I jump many details over. Uh, by using these maximal elements and, and adding some other considerations, we can actually uh, determine all initial states, all vectors A's, that are such that the initial state here is supported only in a single point. So my inverse spectral data determines all vectors A that determine the initial data so that the initial data is supported at the single point. So I can, in kind of way, way construct delta distributions like delta sources at the initial state. When all these initial state that corresponds to concentrated initial state supported only at a single point are determined, then uh, the corresponding these observation time functions they actually give the distances from this red point to different boundary points. So we reconstruct the boundary distance functions that are widely used for the theory of boundary control method, and uh, by using two points condition we can actually see that these uh, collection of all distance boundary distance functions, they determine a graph that is isomorphic to the original graph. So these are the basic in the ingredients of the proof. Okay, let me go to applications. And we consider random walks on graphs uh, and apply these results for inverse spectral problem. So first, what is a random walk on a discrete graph? It's a Markov process that jumps uh, either stays every time uh, at, at the point where the random walk is at that moment or, or jumps to neighboring nodes. So for to define that, we have to assume that the weights uh, at the nodes, uh, mu x, satisfy this condition uh, when we, when, uh, where g's are the weights on, on edges. And if this, con so if this condition is, is satisfied, then we can consider the following probabilities. We can take uh, the probability that we jump from uh, node x to node y to be this uh, g over x mu if the nodes are connected. If the nodes are not connected, then the jumping probability is, is zero. And the probability that uh, we stay at the node where we are at a given moment is given by this. So this is actually, this px x probability has to be uh, non-negative. That is the reason why we require this inequality for the weights. So anyway, when this this these probabilities are defined, then we can define a discrete time Mar Markov walk, the so actual discrete time random walk that is a discrete time Markov chain that that is defined here. So at any time, t is now integer, uh, and this is uh, has value that it, it it has value that is one of these vertices. So it is a process that jumps in this graph. We start from the node, node x0, that is this upper index. And then this is Markov process. And we say that if, if at time t, we are at node x, then the probability that we next time we will jump to node y is given that by this transition probability is pxy. So this is the definition of the discrete uh, time random walk on a graph. And this has now connection to heat equation. Uh, basically, we will say that this, this Feynman form, Katz formula is valid for discrete graphs. So if I have a function defined, that is defined in a graph, and then I consider the following function that is defined in the following way, I, uh, uh, I at the point x, I start a random walk from node x, I jump t times forward, evaluate the function at the point where I arrived, and take the, take the expectation of these random numbers. Then this function u here satisfies the discrete time heat equation that is here. And I recall here this dt is just a finite difference approximation of the, of the, of the derivative. So this just says that this um, final cuts formula that is valid for random walk in, in, uh, for, for Brownian motion, it's valid, similar type of formula is valid for, for, uh, for, for graphs. This connects random walks 
and inverse spectral problems together. And one can, can consider uh, two types of, of, like, of problems. The first is that we consider the first passing times. So this is the uh, this tau x zero y. This is the minimal time when a random walk sent sent from x zero arrives uh, that reaches the point y. So we we start for instance from uh, from one of these nodes here that these white nodes. So we send a random walk. It goes around here, and at some time it arrives first time to node y. And I emphasize that these are here now random processes because the process is random. And here's no, there are no exceptions. So the first passing time is actually random variable. So the first inverse problem that we consider is for this first passing, passing times. If we assume that the, the uh, uh, graph satisfies the two points condition and we consider this boundary set B, then if we um, we know the probability is that if we send a Brownian motion um, uh, from one boundary node x0 and we observe the first uh, passing time at, at other boundary nodes and we know that what is the probability that the passing time has given value t then this determine the transition probabilities okay this actually uh, 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 this determines the graph so we can find these blue nodes or the connections in the interior and also the transition probabilities inside this unknown region. And a very similar uh, problem uh, uh, for random walk is that uh, we, we consider a single realization of random walk, but we consider it uh, over infinite time. So we again assume that, that uh, the, the graph satisfies two point condition. Then we just take any node x0 and send a Brownian, sorry, send random walk to go around here. And then we observe uh, all times when they come to some, bo some boundary nodes. So this can be considered that we have here a, a, this kind of random walk, like a chess piece that is jump, jumping here back and forth. When it is in these blue nodes, it is invisible. When it uh, passes uh, some of these white nodes, then it becomes visible. And we see uh, all, the, all, the, all the times when when the, the random walk has arrived to boundary and we know where it is and when it was there um, and and and, and uh, now we do these observations for infinitely long uh, time so for all 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 times t this also determine um the 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 graph structure of so the all the unknown the, all these blue uh, vertices all connections e and the transition properties so following uh, the, the when we have this indeed when we have the random walk here uh, when and it has this large invisible uh, area where it is hidden and the, these white nodes where we can see it if we can observe it um, for infinite long time then we can see what is the structure of this unknown region then a general remark uh, that why these kind of problems I feel that are interesting for people who study PD is that if we consider uh, that now then we have the graph can be considered as a discrete metric space. So why it is good for continuous problems that if you can can um, solve inverse problems in discrete case. And my own motivation is that we had this this result with Feferan, Ivanov, Kurilev, and Naranayan, which says that if we can. Uh, if you have some uh, smooth Riemannian manifolds that satisfy curvature and diameter bounds, then if we uh, uh, consider just a discrete set, so we, we, we replace the manifold with, with the discrete set, which delta neighborhood is, is, is fills the whole manifold, so that this discrete set is delta dense, and we know an approximative distance function, a function d tilde, that corresponds to the distances in the in the in the manifold, with uh, up to small error when the points x and y are close, and and it is known just to be large when 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 the distance of x and y is large. Then we can actually reconstruct from this discrete space uh, smooth uh, uh, smooth uh, Riemannian manifold that is uh, uh, Lipschitz close to the original manifold. 
So when we uh, have the uh, discrete metric space of points on the manifold, we approximately know the, the distances with small errors. Then we can reconstruct a new manifold n such that uh, there's a different morphism um, uh, which is uh, which lips is constant is, is bounded by one plus something that that depends on the power of this error delta. And also the curvature is bounded, injectivity radius is bounded. So this means that if we somehow can solve um, inverse problems for in discrete approximations, uh, then uh, we can also like extend the, the discrete solutions to a smooth manifold. And for this, I, I, I stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mati, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> very nice talk, Mati. So question and what, so, do you have like any constructive algorithms? Like, ah. Yeah, because that, your theorem, they look like uh, could be constructive, basically. Oh, that is actually an excellent question. So at, at this moment, uh, uh, in uh, this moment, we have uh, uh, that the proof in, in principle gives uh, um, gives a contractive uh, algorithm. If 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 you like the, the steps that are, were described here, uh, that they appear constructive. Uh, there is uh, one problem that I, I jumped over some difficult points that we say that we use maximal elements. So so here we actually uh, uh, have to make some additional constructions where we say that um, uh, um, let's see how to say it. Um, We we <clears throat> we um, uh, uh, that we say that we, we, we assume that there is some uh, finite subspace of so this is a subspace of finite dimensional vector space and we ask that that uh, that it should have a basis that has specific properties so in uh, in in and and this basis actually can be found by uh, like exhaustive search. So uh, this probably this is the algorithm at this moment that we have is not polynomial. So in in principle we have a algorithm, but it can be very very slow. Ah, uh, actually, <clears throat> continuing continuing to your question. So. Uh, for example, can you just do partial? You don't have to have like take, for example, several uh, eigen modes and do just uh, minimum corresponding to like smoothest eigen modes to, to minimum eigen values. Whatever, whatever I don't know what I forgot which way you order, which correspond to uh, like smoothest uh, eigen functions. Yeah, and then. And then, for example, take just few of them and just uh, reconstruct, find some graph, equivalent graph that can be uh, can fit this data. So possibly even non poly if it's it possibly can reconstruct small graph with even uh, with not polynomial time is fine, you know, because yes, yeah. So and that could be valuable reduce order model of this thing. That's maybe it's stupid what I say, maybe it's stupid. No, yeah, yeah, I think it is important question. Now, now we, when all these, indeed when these problems are, uh, uh, when, the, when the model is, is discrete, it is essentially like, for, like the, for instance, if you forget first these weights, and we just want to somehow reconstruct the connections um, um, between the nodes. I mean that we actually have. We can think that that like we we want to reconstruct finite number of 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 of, of, of true force type of, of variables. So so in in principle the that 
that you could go through all you could go through through all um, um, possible graphs and take a list of of those that satisfies these conditions. Um, of course, the weights are real valued, so that, so this pose a little bit problems. But 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 in principle, like you could maybe develop like very very constructive algorithms. And I, I hope that somebody would like to be interested of actually developing this type of algorithms because I, I we could have consider also inverse problems for partial difference equations in a way that we like really first discretize things. And and then saw the soul in some somehow a constructive method uh, um, inverse problem for 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 in a discrete setting. Okay, thank you. And also this gives a possibility to measure that what is the. But now when we speak about the, the that uh, that some algorithm is constructive. In the continuous world, it is sometimes difficult to say that what what constructive means. That it is more about a sociological question than mathematical question. But if you have a discrete problem, then um, we we can like say ask that the question that what is the size of the Turing machine that that solves it, and and how many steps the, the Turing machine needs to need, needs to make, assuming that that um, all these uh, weights are rational. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very excellent question. Yeah. Thank you very may, much. May I also ask a question? Please, please. Yeah. So you see, you used, uh, so to say, the uh, operator with Neumann conditions, and then you yes. used uh, um, Dirichlet data of the eigenfunctions. But can you instead consider the operator with Dirichlet conditions on the boundary and, and use Neumann data of the eigenfunctions? Yeah. Yes. What is this discrete analog of this? Yes. Yeah. So then, then I think that what we then we but then we just say that um, like that we that we put um, uh, uh, require that uh, that that function u has a value zero at this this blue nodes. Uh, sorry, at, at this white, white. nodes. So in, in white nodes. So in, in principle, the problem can be formulated. And I think that uh, also we could say that that we assume that um, I, I think that the the the, uh, uh, the one could also consider Dirichlet to Neumann uh, uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map. Uh, the formulation here that I presented, the, um, we wanted to imitate actually the problem when we would have a closed manifold. And then we have an open subset where we do measurements. That, uh, uh, okay. But you can also think P as a boundary. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and then the, that, yes, that all my pictures. Okay. The the the, the, the measurement set was actually boundary. Yes, I see. But the other question that you already mentioned also is that uh, suppose you have two graphs and in one graph one of the edges is missing. Yeah. And the other is not missing. Can you immediately see this? Uh, so you have two data for graph with missing or without uh, with all the vertices. Can you quickly yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. Because th this is the problem that could be interesting for yes. some kind of control. Oh, oh yes, definitely yes. Uh, so let me think. So the idea. So this uh, this this two points condition actually implies that we have a uh, we have a result that is analogous to, to unique continuation for elliptic equations, which means that that it is not possible that that there would be um, um, there would be large large subsets. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. So no, your so the theorem graph, yeah, yeah. implies that you can you can reconstruct them in principle, but this reconstruction is complicated. Yes, That's but true, suppose yes, yeah. you you want to control what kind of device is produced. Yes? yes, you produce these lattices. Yes, and then you want to check that the lattice is complete, that there is no mistake in the production, that all yes. the edges are. Then you you would be interested to to have this information quickly yes that, 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 that i don't know 
And uh, well, I was saying that this um, two points condition implies a result that is close to unique continuation property, yes. so that the eigenfunction cannot vanish in that set. But, if, that, but if we, can, we have actually constructed like um, graphs where the eigenfunctions vanish. Um, yeah. One yeah. is in, in 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 quite large set. So that in this case, if you have a set where the eigenfunctions are always zero, you can remove any connection inside there, and doesn't it doesn't somehow uh, uh, destroy the data. But but for like I said, that if the if the if the, the two, two points condition is is is, is valid to, to to several standard lattices, and there. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and also, if if you look at this problem, so you see, you said that you need this height condition, yes? yes. So you can remove one edge. Which uh, keep, could you please keep the the picture? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, please, yeah, yes. You, you can remove one of the edges on, as on the right, yes, yes, on the right picture, yes. Uh, yes. Of course, you can also remove two edges which are horizontal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you cannot remove one horizontal and one which is uh, which has an angle, not horizontal. Yes, it's a, that is true. Yes, then, then if it remove indeed several of these, um, too many of and of both horizontal and both uh, like this kind of diagonal uh, connections, then the graph uh, may lose actually, it probably loses these two points condition. Okay, okay, no, no, the, the, uh, the root... condition, and we don't know. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so you don't know, so they may be no, non no. non reconstructable. Okay, yes, yes, yes. We but go you outside know. this category. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Also, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments, please? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Mati, for the very, very nice talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much.